in an email that I sent. So welcome to day number four. So this is technically the the last day of the printer build, and we're a little we're a little behind schedule, but we also discovered that we've got the after hours open source chain gang. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna loop. Oh, who's the author of the chain gang? We're going to loop Jeez. Sam Cook's <laughs> chain gang until we're done tonight. So, okay. So, altogether, progress is pretty good. And I think people are learning quite a bit. I do appreciate how we're teaching each other. Like, right now, what's in a shop right now is it's quite good. We've got a bunch of frames and axes pretty much finished for most of the machines. And the next steps right now are implementing the controller. So we've got all the parts. That should go pretty, pretty quickly because it's essentially about attaching a number of components to the 3D printed controller. So like all the placeholders are there. It, you don't have to measure stuff, which is typically like, okay, where does something go? Well, you can pretty clearly at that point look at the model and follow that exactly. But what I would absolutely suggest, because there are some little details as everywhere that we absolutely do it together as a group so that we leave nobody behind because once again if you mess up some order or like you know the worst thing is you can fry things because we're going to actually end up turning this thing on or get a shock if you don't put on the power cord on in a in a proper way because we're building this thing from scratch uh, from the the outlet on the control panel the power cord everything is included we're, we're going through the process a little bit of soldering um, where I would suggest we set, set up a couple of people on that, uh, but primarily zip ties and holes through a 3D printed, printed panel. panel. So, so that's, that's the process for today. For today, we're going to do start with a electronics panel. There's, there's wrap up on the axes, and we could probably uh, either start like right away on the control panel to get everybody going, since there's just a, a little bit of wrap up on the frames, uh, and then maybe right after we're done with the controller. Uh, stay a little bit hmm, to finish up to swarm on the rest of the frames that aren't finished. There's like a couple that need need a little bit, uh, but then after that, there's a bit more. So we've got the open source insulated heated bed, which means we're working with nichrome wire and getting to understand how that works, how you can send uh, electricity through a wire to make controlled heat using the universal controller. So that's that's there too. And after that is the Perhaps the hardest part, which is, okay, now we're going to walk, well, there's the extruder. So we've got extruders, that mounting is, uh, we've got the extruders pretty much prepared, so it's relatively quick. But the thing that's, that's the big effort is, okay, now we're going to all wire this up, uh, order the, the chain, the, all the cables to be very nice and clean. Uh, and we don't want to do what, what you're seeing in the workshop right now, which is like a, a crow's nest of wires on the printer. You want to clean it up right up, up front because if you have that, I mean, it'll end up breaking or, or disconnecting or whatever. So let's clean that up as we go along. But so controller, extruder, heated bed. Man, it's a, it's a bit. We've got quite a bit. We are we are a little bit behind. I, I thought we'd be done with the controller yesterday. We have to make that up today. And so I really suggest that yes, we all work together. I think we had an interesting time of how. Uh, we both did and did not work together. It took us, I think, a long time to uh, get to the point where we're actually helping each other, but the difficulty and the learning curve there was, I think, pretty significant. But this time around, since the control panel is much more controlled in terms of how it looks and how it works, I think we can do the following each other much more effectively. Uh, I think it's also simpler, but there are a few critical details that we have to pay attention to. So with that said, uh, let's go back to the machine design guys. So. Uh, on a page called OSC Machine Design Guide. Pasting it into the chat. Let's review a little bit. So the critical aspects of uh, um, three components, frames, axes, controller. We've gone a little bit through that, so let's recap the main points about it. So can anyone here now conceptualize a frame of any size and shape using the, the basic. The summary of that all is that we're working with flat, six sides. We've got a cubic space frame. 
flat sides, which are much quicker to build from if you're doing a basic frame than, than with angle iron. Because if you are welding, JB welding, or actually screwing the corners together, it's actually very easy because it's self-aligning. If you have CNC cut frame pieces, uh, self-aligning is the key. You don't have to use your, um, your right angle to do and redo a typical layup, uh, welding layup job, which is, takes a long time. Here, we've got digital cut. We can make a frame of any size. And the plates that we use, the flats that we start with, can be any size, like 1 8 inch, 3 millimeter for the 3D printer, down to up to 1 inch thick steel slabs, 1 by 12s even for a really huge frame. So you're talking about some serious uh, size scalability. On the universal axis, we, we will, um, so tomorrow we'll, we'll start playing with the different sizes, but we've got the bushings, the 2 inch bushings you might have seen in the box uh, for the very heavy shafts. We're, in this workshop, we're scaling between 8 millimeter to 1 inch to 2 inch, which at the 2 inch gets very heavy, and that's why we need the 10 printers that we will have to all be operational in order to 3D print the parts for that universal axis in a matter of hours and um, not like a week, this is hours and days. Uh, so real-time prototyping and, and printing, as soon as we get a decent working design, we can start printing. On the machine controller, universal machine controller, we went over that a little bit yesterday, and to recap that, you've got a widely accessible set of components where the whole control panel with everything included is about $50 plus the 3D print. Um, you've got the RepRap Rep Arduino Mega Pololu Shield, that's the uh, stepper driver controller on top of an Arduino. So we're using the, the ubiquitous open source Arduino platform, which is one of the leading open source hardware projects out there. It's, uh, it's a great project. It's spawned thousands and millions of people into small electronics and microcontrollers. It's the core of our 3D printer. It can be used for many different machines. The uh, beauty of it is because you can download the plans, you can also CNC mill or fabricate one of those boards yourself. Say you don't have supply chains available, but you have a CNC circuit mill and copper clad boards and access to some components, you can build them yourself. Uh, once again, the advantage of such an approach being that you can control the life cycle of that build. You can make it last forever because if something breaks, you can replace it. And therefore the onus is on the design to make it designed for repair, designed for disassembly, designed for lifetime, according to OSC specifications. Uh, to me, that the closed loop material cycle is perhaps the most relevant ecological point of the whole global village construction set, in addition to the fact that you're reusing components and, and have product ecologies where we reuse parts in many places. So the Arduino. 3D printer, yes, you can make that. How about your induction furnace for metal melting? Yes, you can do that. You're going to need some heavy power elements to handle that current, but the brain that can control that at 32 megahertz clock speed is the Arduino. It's sufficient, so very powerful, very powerful platform. It's a technology that a decade or two, maybe like two decades, uh, last century, <laughs> It's pretty much not, not really accessible. Uh, when did that Arduino actually start up? 2005, 17. 2005. I mean, think about that. Before that, the idea of people use making their own electronics and controllers and any sort of automation was completely the realm of the specialist and, and more expensive parts. Before we had the Arduino, we would have 3D printers that cost $10,000 at the very minimum. Right now, you can build a printer for $250. It's amazing cost reductions, and that is not stopping. In fact, it's accelerating. So the potential for seizing the power of distributed economies is here. But as with all powerful tools, we can use powerful tools to our own destruction or to our own good. So it's once again a human judgment and our 
positive outlook on life, the transcendence of a scarcity mindset, where the opposite of scarcity is a growth mindset. So this work is about cultivating a growth, growth mindset. Because when we can show you, how does, that, how does technology relate to a growth mindset? If you can see that you can control your physical environment in such tangible ways, that has a psychological effect. So we think it's easy, much easier to go through the physical world to help people expand on the psychological front and, and mental front, which is really um, what we put into our minds is what controls what options we think we have in life. Now today, so let's keep moving on. I would actually like to go and skip down to the lesson on shafts and bearings, because those are some of the most fundamental items. And I will share my screen for the remote people. Uh, so William, if you wouldn't mind going to shafts and bearings, and the design manual, which is lesson number 14. One can say that the ball bearing is the heart of modern civilization. What's the relevance of a ball bearing? the bearing ball. Uh, it allows for rotary motions, things that spin. What are those things? Those are things like engines. That's essentially the industrial age. For which reason, understand shafts and bearings and how you can have motion either linear or rotary. So there's mainly like two types of motion. There's li linear and rotary. And the concept of bearings and shafts is how you achieve that li linear or rotary motion, which, for example, if you want to drive a car, you're going to have to have an engine which has bearings in it. Without the bearings, you would wear things out. The, wearing, the bearings essentially provide frictionless uh, ability to have high-speed motion with steel. So engines, compressors, power plants, the substance of modern civilization, the, the back end of what we do is based on the ball bearing. And we also mentioned about the air bearing for the space age. So you go from the ball bearing to the industrial age. With the air bearing, you go into the space age, where you have things like turbines and jet engines and vacuum pumps that run semiconductor manufacturing. So semiconductor manufacturing a lot of it happens under vacuum in very clean room environments. Without the ball bearing to run those, or air bearing to run those very, very low pressure vacuum pumps, you would not have your computers. You would not be here. So that is, uh, shafts and bearings are very much relevant to our modern standard of living. In history, what happened before? We went from stone to wood to metal. And before the 1700s or 1800s, all the machines around were made of, of wood. And they would be bigger and more clunky. It wouldn't last as long and would get us to where we were a civilization until the Industrial Revolution. And then wood was replaced because we found how to make metal and make it efficiently. So in history, the transition came from rocks to wood to metal. And now what is it beyond metal? I don't know, maybe composites, where now we have the ability to intersperse molecules into materials such that you get very unique properties, such as we talked about yesterday even with uh, embedding fibers into plastic to make high, very high performance reinforced plastics that are great for, say, modern super lightweight car bodies and frames. So that's kind of, you can say that's maybe the next evolution of uh, materials today. With the ability to access things like the air bearing making lathe through pretty much open source technology. So open source always kind of follows along with the latest developments. There are no limits to what open source can handle. Sometimes people ask, well, can you do this? Can you do that? Well, open source is just a development methodology. We can develop anything in society with it. Uh, so what is a shaft and bearing? So the, the very common application in general design is, the, for example, on the universal axis, where do you have shafts and bearings? 
You have the linear guides, which are the rods. Those are your shafts. They provide structure and stiffness and a very smooth gliding surface for precise motion. Where are their bearings? We are using linear bearings, which are the metal objects with little balls inside of them. Or we're using actually the gliding plastic bearings, the IGUS brand. If you look at the D3D bill of materials, you can see both in there on the wiki. Uh, the idea being there, if you did not have those bearings, you would have one for more friction, or you would wear out the actual steel. And we've seen that with the previous designs of D3E, if you ran the bearings super fast, like four or five times the normal speed that we're seeing down there, they'd actually start eating away at the shafts. So yes, there is a bit of friction there. And we're actually addressing that in the universal axis system just to bring this to reality because we have two y axes and an x axis in between. If they are not parallel, the, um, there would be pressure exerted by the x axis that would bind up on either end. We're actually accounting for that, so we're, we're getting rid of that effect in order not to wear out the shafts and uh, to, to relieve that pressure by the, uh, the I the idler piece that's actually on the x-axis, if you look at D3D 19.04, you'll see on the x-axis there's this piece beyond the idler piece that accepts the non-parallel motion. But that's, that's an important thing. You want to take care of your shafts and, and bearings so that they do not wear out. Uh, that's a way to, to address that in our current system. So in the 3D printer we have shafts and bearings in other places. Where else? Where else is there a shaft? On the motor. Uh, typically for a shaft, you want two points of support. Well, we actually have that in both the axis and the motor. Inside the motor, the shaft goes all the way through the motor and supported on the bottom side and the top side. Two points of support are very critical. On the universal axis, you have points of support at one end and the other. So that thing is stiff and, and fixed, it can't bend, and so forth. So the, this very simple concept of using two bearings upon a shaft applies universally throughout technology. For example, in a live track, if you look at, on the wiki, universal rotor, we are building exactly that point, two point of support Universal rotor. Uh, so take a look at look at the first picture. That's exactly what we have there too. No, second. Go down. This one. I think it's up. It's under build. Click on build in the in the index. Go very up and click on build. No, down. Up. Um, table context is not there. Go. there. That's a shaft and bearings. This is now heavier. This is two inches. But it gives you the concept of what that is talking about. Two inch shaft, bearing, bearing. Two bearings. If you had one bearing, this thing would wobble around. Very, very basic concept. So that applies to the small stepper motors. It applies to the universal axis, which has got two points of support. But that way, because you've got that much separation on a shaft, when you put a very heavy load on a shaft, this thing is not moving anywhere. So the basic design is two strong plates. They're half inch in this case. Behind that, you see a motor. The motor does not serve to hold the force that is exerted on the, axis, on the, the shaft. The motor is actually coupled through a chain coupler. So this is our universal rotor, which you can attach that to the tractor, to a big trencher, to any rotor, uh, while keeping the tool head, which is mounted on a shaft, super stiff, it's not moving anywhere. So that's a very basic shaft and a bearing concept. How do you mount the bearings? In a case where it's super heavy, you got it. here we're using many, a number of, those are three quarter inch bolts, five eighths or three quarter inch bolts, four bolts on each bearing. That fixes, uh, what would you call that? Radial motion, like the motion along the radius. 
that fixes the bearings and the bolts onto the metal fix that in place very firmly. So you can get loads of up to like, if you mount something very close, you can hold like 10,000 pounds with these bearings. They're rated for about 5,000 or so. Uh, on the end of the shaft, you have more leverage. If you press on the end of the shaft, that's called leverage. Over here, you might be able to do maybe like 5,000 or less. The, the amount of force, the longer this is, when you press down on a shaft, the more you're amplifying the force, and therefore you need the, the distance of those to be longer in order to support it. To say you do a 5,000 pound force here, the force up there is going to be like, this is half as long as this, the distance between the bearings is half as long as the shaft distance, you'd multiply that by a factor of two, so you have 10,000 pounds on that bearing. If the bearings were very, very close, so it's such that the shaft is maybe one foot, and say the bearings are a couple of inches, you're multiplying that by that factor, so that spread is, is uh, basically is able to absorb the loads but that, that distance has to be sufficient for, for that force, force amplification to be contained. Another point about this, what about axial, not axial, sorry, not radial, that we talked about right now, but axial motion? How do you prevent the shaft from getting pushed in and out? Because, hey, those are bearings, those are holes, you can pull, push that in and out. Well, you gotta contain that. Uh, in our system, we use plain shafts for ease of working with. Um, there are no machine steps or like retaining rings or anything physical that prevents the shaft from moving in and out. That's a design principle where we're saying, hey, uh, let's minimize the machining on this. So, how, so, but you still want to hold the shaft. So say you don't have a lathe or uh, some heavy equipment to make physical artifacts upon the shaft itself, Use clamp collars. Clamp collars are a common thing. There are both set screws in the collar of the bearing and in the clamp collar. Um, so you're clamping down, so if you try to push that in, it doesn't. It cannot go that way. But what about getting pulled out? Yeah, it still could, so you have to put another one on the other side. And you have to put as many of them as possible as needed to prevent the shaft from coming out under large forces. And that's a basic concept of a rotor, rotary shaft, mounting that with bearings using collars. If you're using, what we found is that it's relatively easy to make, um, let's see if I can show that. Uh, I'm gonna go to Google Photos, the album where we did micro track. So, those are clamp collars that you can get off the shelf, but you can also make them yourself. So, if you have a piece of tubing that fits exactly on a shaft, when you cut, <laughs> cut that in half and weld uh, flanges on that, uh, by cutting it in half, you're taking off oh wait, enough materials that if you press them together, it's a very, very tight fit. So you can make these, and they would look like William King. Come on back. So I'm going to go to an album that is micro track uh, 17. Oh, wrong. I'll put paste that into the the chat box. So we'll go to these guys. So I'm going to paste this in so you guys can actually all, William, are you in the yeah. chat? Paste it into the link so you can take a look at some of these pictures. What do I mean by a shaft collar? So, one year we took apart the tractor, 
to build another one, to build a micro track, so we recycle parts. But to show you what a what a clamp collar looks like. Yeah, so in that chapter there, you're seeing the entire build. Um, <clears throat> but let's look at the detail of a clamp collar that's DIY made, because <laughs> the idea is there, there is powerful. Um, you can use the, the model of the clamp collar for very heavy machines up to the tractor. Uh, because the fundamental equation there is, okay, you've got shafts that you can get. We worked with up to three-inch shafts for tractors. Very heavy. So you can, that means you can make a bulldozer out of that, like a 20,000-pound bulldozer. We're talking about as serious as it gets. Uh, three-inch shafts. And a DIY way to make that mount upon bearings with zero machining. That's an important concept. If you're gonna to go to John Deere, they're probably gonna have shafts that are machined finely uh, with steps or whatever geometries that physically lock the shaft from moving in and out. And you can do the same thing in a different way. Let me see if I can find a <laughs> picture of that. I'm not finding a picture, but um, I can, if you go into the design guide, I'm, uh, I can draw that. Uh, I'm going to add a slide, and I'll. <laughs> I want to actually draw this because, like, if you can actually handle mounting wheels or rotors of any size, that means if you know how to build a frame, you know how to mount wheels upon it, and that gets you to a heavy-duty vehicle of any type with very accessible techniques of building. So, and we're kind of, we're going through the, some of the pictures of MicroTrack, and I'm going to change the document, and let's do a little experiment on the document itself. So I'm going to open up, once again, the edit, editability of the document and paste it into the chat box. So you can now edit that as well. But what I'll do is, uh, okay, right there, uh, someone created this page here. But what does, <clears throat> William, if you wanna point to that, I'm, I'm gonna draw that because I think if you get anything out of this lesson, uh, this would be a good thing to get. What is this double split shaft collar? and how do we make it ourselves. So you can start with, William, are you there? Yeah. You can start with a, with a pipe and a smaller pipe inside of that, uh, not a smaller pipe, this is a pipe of some, say this is, since we're going industrial grade and to as heavy as it gets, mm -hmm. let's take our three inch shaft and three inch piece of tubing. You can get that off the shelf. Now, the three inch tubing, when it's precise like that, and this, this does relate a lot to shafts and bearings, because um, after shafts and bearings, you have how do you mount other things upon shafts? So you got a collar like that that's three inches. If a shaft fits exactly inside of it and can s s uh, s slip in and out, how do you turn this into a device that can clamp on it? you would do two things. One, cut it in half this way. So I'm going to draw a line where you cut it in half. Now what is cutting it in half? So that's uh, my symbol for cutting it in half. Put on a bandsaw or torch. You can torch it out. Cut it in half. What happens when you cut it in half? You, you take out a little bit of material at the cut. That, because even with a bandsaw, a tiny bit, 
but because this this collar fits tightly upon a shaft, when you take that out, and then when you compress that, the fit on that is absolute hold, absolute hold. Because you took out that material, that means it's a smaller smaller diameter for the, the collar. So what do you do then? So what you do then is you weld on, you take two uh, flanges, so half inch, say half inch steel, you weld that on to one half. And let's make, make that. So feel free to draw in there too and help me out, guys. Uh, so you put two flanges on it like that. You weld them to the two pieces. And those are your flanges. And then if you, if you have a hole through those flanges, what do you do there? You put a bolt in there, like a three-quarter inch bolt. So I'm going to draw a bolt in there. So you bolt it. And when you bolt that, a three-quarter inch bolt has a few thousand pounds of clamp force. Well, with that kind of clamp force, you're going to absolutely bind down so hard that that, um, that shaft is not moving anywhere. So say this is this kind of clamp. Uh, it could be the thing you attach to the shaft. Or this clamp could function like what we saw before, the shaft collar, which prevents, which rests against the bearing and prevents the shaft from moving in and out. This is, uh, the clamp collars are how we built Lifetrack 1. Those were off the shelf, five bucks each, off surplus center in the US, USA. Um, these are a DIY version for much more strong versions of that. Uh, for that kind of duty which is relevant to bulldozers and heavy machines. Uh, so I say yes, this is a pretty important concept to understand. The, What's that line in the middle of it? I missed that part. You're cutting, you're slitting it, the tube down the middle. Okay. So you got two clamshells. Got Once it. again, the clamshell model. The clamshell model is a very powerful concept for DIY or, or accessible design. You have two pieces that come together. That means you do not have, you just take the bolts apart and the thing comes right off and you can liberate the thing. If you, if you have another mechanism, you, if it's say was a clamp collar that you have to take out all the way, I mean, these, those things seize up. If it's a three inch shaft, good luck. If it's been out in the field and rusted a little bit, you're not gonna take it off. But with a, with a clamped mechanism like this, Easy, no problem. Still, the, all the axial forces on the bearings. There are axial forces on the bearings, exactly. So can it handle it? The axial resistance of the bearings, the, of the three-inch bearings. So we're using these bearings. Well, I won't pull them up, but they look just like that. Three-inch bearings. They're wow. pretty big. We have some in the shop. It can handle it. It can handle it. <laughs> yes, wow. it can handle it. They're rated for uh, several thousand pounds of of axial force. I think it's 5,000 per bearing. Oh, wow. That's yes, good. they're big bearings. They have some big balls in them. <laughs> uh, the ball bearing. Um, so, to summarize what we've learned so far, the ball bearing is the secret of industrial civilization. How do you make a ball bearing? Because if you're talking about shafts and bearings, <coughs> Use the Oops. Yeah, uh, because if we get stuck in the post-apocalypse, which I don't believe in, but if you do, basic equipment can get you to that. So the CNC multi-machine that we have, if you add grinder elements, how do you make ball bearings? Google this, but what, what they do is you, you make little rough balls of shape, but the ball bearings are very, very precise. How do you do that? Basically what happens is there's a rotating disc, balls fall, fall down in there, the disc rotates, it's a grinder disc. And when the balls fall down in there, all their sides get exactly to the space between the grinding disc and a flat surface. Uh, for the remote people we can act, probably inc include a video, Google how ball bearings are made. That's very accessible, the ball bearings have been around for decades. Um, 
probably when was the first ball bearing made? Probably at the turn of the 19th. No. Uh, maybe like 1900 or so, a little before that. Uh, because you need things like ball bearings to, to have rotating shafts. Clamp shaft collars are very important. Let's go through a couple more other concepts here about, about shafts and bearings. Uh, we talked about a two-point two support of a shaft with bearings. If there are some, the relevant part is typically motors have two, two supports, but you'll notice that some have one. If they have one, you have to make the provision to add the second one so that you can handle the rate. Oh, there you go. Hey, this is called <laughs> wow. a double split shaft collar. You can see it's a little bent out of shape. And let's get, uh, well, let me show you, show that to the crew. Double split shaft collar. So how do you get all bent? Uh, so you see some, so let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, let me uh, put this in here. like this. Oh, look, look at this guy. That's pretty pretty heavy duty. This is uh, for a three-inch shaft. The holes we punched on the open source iron worker, of course. But if you have, so we build the iron worker. We punch the holes with it. Now, that's a two-inch piece of half-inch steel. When we punch the holes, I mean, the forces are such that you end up bending the metal, so that's how, how that, that is bent a bit. But it still works because the, the, middle, the middle piece, that's precise. It's called drawn over mandrel tubing. It's a very precise shaft collar material. Did you punch the holes and then weld it to the... Uh, yes, oh, okay, absolutely. Uh, when you punch things in steel, you want to work with flats. You can't punch. You can't punch steel that's like a tube because you'll just flatten the tube. Um, or in a geometry, like if you welded this first, you might not be able to get that punch element, or I don't know, it might interfere some. Well, you're welding because this is half inch. You don't get into issues of warping the tube so much. Uh, but there's a heavy weld on that. Oh, there, there we go. We got some pictures. Uh, we use this on the, this was a 56 horsepower tractor that did the nut plant out in 2016. So this comes off a real machine that, and we can completely reuse this. This was used to keep the shaft from moving radially back and forth between the frame. This has to be very accurate if you don't want the vibration of the shaft. The shaft spins only at maybe up to 50 RPM. So the inaccuracy on this, the wings that you see here, is not relevant because it's very slow spinning. Now, if you were coupling a very fast spinning, like maybe 3,000 RPM, uh, that would be an issue. Uh, you'd, be, you'd have to have balance of weight uh, or otherwise you have to otherwise balance it if it were bent out. Right. So the tubing itself, you can buy it off the shelf. Now, this tubing isn't cheap. Ah. It costs for three inch, oh man, you're talking about several dollars an inch. Wow. One of these tubes costs like Ten dollars or twenty dollars. No, it's it's not cheap. That material is several dollars per inch when you get to the very heavy stuff. And this is where the open source metal printer is very relevant because you're talking about uh, increasing the value of that welding wire, which is your feedstock for a metal printer. Uh, you increase the value from that. The material in here costs like. 20 or 30 dollars a pound uh, it's above 10 raw metal costs a dollar or less per pound when you get virgin steel it costs <laughs> about a dollar a pound these days if you take scraps scrap steel it 
costs a few cents per pound. But this would be an excellent case for this is how you're building your tractors. You're, you're 3D printing this, but then you probably want to put it on a machine and then ream it out smoothly. But the rough shape that you can get from a 3D print would be an excellent use case for the relevance of a metal 3D printer based on a MIG welder. Question? Yeah, uh, would it be possible to uh, do that with a torch table? You could just maybe uh, cut out sections of that pipe? Oh, that's another way to do it. Another way to do it is you can only cut flats, so you can cut rings, and then you would have to weld the rings together. That is a lot of work. Uh, and then each ring is only so precise, so at the end of the day, you would still have to machine it out to make it very smooth. And what happens with torching is you get flame hardening. So it becomes very difficult to machine that unless you're grinding. Grinders are used after. Uh, gr grinders are relevant for uh, super hard material, but machining is relevant for softer material. Uh, so that's the, that's the case there. But this concept is very important, and what I'm holding in my hand is the key to a DIY bulldozer. So three inch shafts, three inch bearings. How much is a three inch bearing? $50 a pop. So reasonable, but we're talking about three inches, meaning bulldozers as heavy as they get. So uh, quite affordable. And you need a minimum of four, four bearings. But, but eight if you have bearings, the balls the, the flanged bearings, assemblies. Uh, the, so, not, so these are clamp collars. The bearings are the, the square looking square things with the four bolt holes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is um, an important concept. With the initial tractor, we didn't really know that you could do that and that would work so well because we found that this works well enough that you can mount wheels, like say you had a sprocket on this, which we do on a tractor. Another variation of this is where this, you're mounting to a, can you pull up, can you maybe find a sprocket, like the, the microtrack sprocket. We can drive a tractor, we did that with a small tractor, uh, but we also did that with the, 52 horsepower, uh, about 5,000 pound tractor that pulled a key line plow and flail mode into the field. We use this assembly to mount the drive sprocket for the actual tracks. So we know that by using clamp bolt strength of 10,000 pounds or more per bolt, you have enough strength with this to mount even drive for tracks or wheels directly into a shaft. That is amazing. Because otherwise, that sprocket is mounted like this. Um, actually, I, I take that back. This one is not, but on a bigger tractor. Because here, we were actually quite constrained with the size. So we did not have space for this and we mounted the sprocket directly to a hydraulic motor. In a bigger tractor, and that would be Google OSC nut plant out. And you'll see the crazy machine upon which this uh... No, no, okay. Open Source Ecology hazelnut planting, hazelnut planting tractor, yes? Uh, so when these things are clamped onto a shaft, um... Are they designed to be able to run under <coughs> axial load, or is it just, just in, uh, if there shouldn't be a sudden axial load, and it won't slip out of place? This is it, seems like, it seems like this would rub up against the, uh, the side of whatever you're... Right, you can use this in two ways. One is, yeah, yeah this machine right there. there. Oh, yeah. Of the, of there. The How about that? Build that tomorrow. <laughs> that, that, that was a heavy traction device that had 7,000 pounds of pulling force. Uh, do you see the dent on the back of our van? <laughs> <laughs> what happened there was that the van ended up in a ditch. So I said, no, can I pull it out with this? Well, it just pulled it right out and it smashed into the tractor. <laughs> so this thing has traction. 
at and is this. So now you know how to mount heavy duty traction onto larger machines. Yeah. It was, uh, again, uh, whether these things are designed to run under axial load or whether it's just to prevent against occasional slippage. Both. It seems like it would run off against the uh, yeah, if, if you're rubbing against, against a bearing, the race of a bearing is it's not rubbing against it, it's spinning with it. Okay. So you can push this up against the bearing and use that for the axial load you know, suppression. Now, how much how much force is that part with the uh, built with sand? Like the, uh, five the thousand, it will be the bearing themselves, 5,000 pounds for the 3 inch bearing. Uh, okay. So you can look at the specs, you can Google that. Um, Circle center or Google three inch bearing. It will have. Uh, you can find it online. Typically, they don't list. They. You have to dig for specs of the bearings. So if you Google for three inch bearings, you look at their specs. They they should give you the the radial and axial loads for those bearings. Um, yeah, they're they've got like a spherical that go into the housing. Mm -hmm. So the housing holds the the bearing part. The bearing's kind of rounded, so it stays in there. Um, yeah, yeah. So simple ways to go mount things onto shafts. So what are some other concepts we can take uh, take a look at? Uh, let's mention a couple of more things. Set screws, uh, set screws, and and other ways to mount things. So if you don't have a clamp mounting mechanism, the other way to do it in a relatively easy way is, is like they do it on an agricultural power takeoff shaft which is splined. Splined shafts are the other concept. In that case you don't need the bolts if you have splines so a thing that looks like a star it's called splines. If you have splines well the difficult part there is you need a coupler that has splines built into it too so that's like a little more advanced but it's an easy way to get huge traction and splines are very common. So for example on the back of any tractor you will have a power takeoff shaft which has splines which you just clamp something on put like a little little set screw in there and it holds. <laughs> um, what about if you have a collar so you just made a collar without clamping. Clamping is the ultimate way that's like the take-home lesson but you can use set screws. Set screws are not as strong not at all. Um, if you do set screws, you want to have two of them at 60 degrees or 30 degrees. That's like the way the physics works out. Is you don't want them opposite. Uh, you don't want them at a right angle necessarily. Say what? And the stepper motors, I think they're like that or like that. Um, an angle. Uh, why can't you do them like that? I think it's because you're actually like splitting the thing apart. That's the like the subtle thing. You're splitting that when you're putting all that force in a set screw, you're egging out the actual um, whatever you got Shaft. mounting. Yeah. <coughs> Whereas it's you don't do that there. Um, so in a study of this, like when you think about this and you think about the forces that you can handle. Um, we figured that, yeah, you can do this for direct mounting, and, and I don't see anybody else doing that, but if, but if you do do that, you have access to easy way to do what otherwise would be very expensive, which means it would require machining and particular geometries that prevent things from slipping or rotating. So that's important. Uh, typical way to do this is also like with keyways. So keyways are common. But keyways, once again, require machining. Uh, so if you're left without machining, you can do this. But if you have access to machining, you can use keyways, which are... Um, keyway. So a keyway is where you have an ind indentation within the shaft itself. And... Let me sh keep sharing my screen here. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. There it is. There, now it looks almost here. So keyways and shafts. So keyways are, are a rectangular piece of stock. 
and they go into an indentation in a shaft so that and the, and the coupler also has a keyway in it so that keyway prevents the physical slip of the coupler uh, so you're transferring force instead of just spinning very common thing keyways are kinda like from my perspective if I could avoid a keyway we're talking about like your heavy uh, heavy DIY equipment it's just very easy keyways are <clears throat> not as simple because you have to punch them in you have to put set screws in sometimes it's hard to access the set screws so when you're building very large machines it's uh, you leave yourself enough space like on a the tractor we built in two days with four people that's pretty that, radically that was, fast yeah. uh, <laughs> but it's simple because we don't have much of geometrical constraints it was much easier to build that 54 horsepower nut plant out tractor than it was to build a micro track because in a micro track we're starting to engineer for precise geometries and that takes time you have to have exact exact fits hose routing there's tight space for fittings but in a bulk tractor like the box with wheels concept like life track one or this life track uh, version iterative version here with a oh, couple sorry. of power cubes uh, so that thing is essentially a, a frame the box beam tubing you've got the shafts and couplers the universal axis uh, universal rotor um, go back to the nut plant out on a on a nut plant out tractor you've got a bunch of common machines which allowed us to build it in two days with four people power cubes we already had universals we already had two of them shafts and the clamp collars, we had to build those. Uh, and the frame had to be welded up. But you can conceptually see that if you have that, man, it's a Lego set. It really is. Except you have to have one inch wrenches. <laughs> Box with wheels. Now the track is welded together. The track is, is one of those things that we cut that all uh, on the iron worker machine that we made. Uh, but we had to weld the link pieces which are uh, holes punched with an iron worker it takes a long time for a track like that you want to CNC cut that out that would be like okay bam file hit on the torch table walk away done otherwise man that took what is it maybe 20 hours 20 human hours per track you made the bug? yeah we made it wow. It took us 20 hours per track about so a lot of work I mean that's heavy work I mean 20 probably more than that we probably took us like one day with like three four people five five so it's like more like 40 hours uh, per track did you use this on the life track one as well which one this no in the life track one we used off-the-shelf clamp collars uh, and we had two inch shots on that not three inch so that was off the shelf. We didn't know that was possible at that time. But then we said, hey, wait a minute. Clamp force, when you look at the numbers for a one-inch bolt, Google clamp force of one-inch bolt. 50,000? What is it? Clamp. Grade 8 bolt. Clamp force of a one-inch grade 8 bolt or grade 5. -er. For general general purposes clamp loads of a one inch bolt is 38,000 pounds you screw down that nut and you've got 38,000 pounds of force that's serious stuff so I looked at those numbers and I'm saying wait a minute if you have that you can absolutely do traction on wheels too and, it, and that's the case yep I think you have to be Cognizant of uh, that's the clamping load that you're gonna, you're gonna get out of that hole, yep. so that's the force you're gonna get. Yep. But you also have to multiply that by because you're not using the shearing capacity of the bolt, you're using the friction between the two yep. pieces of steel. Yep. And so you have to multiply that by your friction coefficient of steel on steel, yep. which is point, point yeah, point some something. So you have to factor that down. Yep. You do, it's not just 38,000 pounds, and then you also have to have your factor of safety on that. Yep. To, to come up with a reasonable design, but yep. yeah, the, the, yep. that exactly. Sense. And yeah. 38,000 pounds, that's a lot. Yeah, that's, that's also time so that's serious. You're it preventing, is, yeah, absolutely. So, in a, in a direct drive application like this here on a nut plant out tractor, 
Um, so behind it we had a flail mower and a key line plow, all plowed, all done in one operation. So we basically mow down the grass, cut the key line in there, planted the nuts right in there. Pretty sweet. Um, if you talk about the coefficient of friction, good point. Steel on steel, so you, you got a steel collar on a, on a steel shaft. The coefficient of friction is not one, it's less. One is where it's just holding tight, like it was solid. It's going to be a fraction. You can also increase that. They have like grit. I don't know. I've never used it, but they have grit where you can actually paint it on or spray it on. And it basically has little particles that when you clamp down on them, they pretty much get you to a solid bind. Uh, and that comes off when you take it off. But basically, think about if before, think about this way. If you put the clamp collar on, but put sand or something that does not crush in between there, then it's much harder to make that spin because it's that sand biting into um, into the metal, actually biting into it under all, all those thousands of pounds. I'm just playing some music there. Okay, so that's that's a good concept there. Let's see what else, and then we'll wrap up because we're actually at, at one hour here. Um, I talked a bit about how to build it, <clears throat> how do you produce this. Um, maybe I'll wrap up with this. So we're talking about some heavy duty stuff here that doesn't have to be super precise in terms of making the clamp collars. The bearings themselves do provide good, good accuracy. Um, so they're off the shelf commercial parts. Um, but how do you actually end up making your own bearings? Um, you can do so so I'll leave you with this and the point is that with if you buy ball bearings you can print 3d printed housings uh, so you can make like if we wanted to do the two inch shafts with ball bearings we can 3d print the plastic and use steel balls once again arriving at the concept of the plastic metal composite but I'll show you an example here so um, opens uh, so I'll go to my log and I'll go to 3d printed linear bearing let's take a look at this because this is quite interesting the plastic will hold up. to a limit plastic is 5 to 10,000 psi so go to 3d printed linear bearing and this is open source and you can download this print it and make oh, a high cool. precision system okay. look at this this is a super precise linear bearing with recirculating balls. The way it works is when this thing goes up and down, it's contained on this axis. Um, the balls circulate, and this is absolutely amazing. And you can do that right now at home. So you're knocking out the cost of expensive precision drive systems. Now, how accurate do you get this? Good enough to make a very high quality 3D printer. So the guy who built this, I saw him at the Midwest, Midwest RepRap Festival, the 3D printer meetup of the United States. And he made a 3D printer with this and the print quality is very high. So yes, this is possible. So think about scaling this up. If you want to do a long axis system, like for a house printer or for a large torch table, we know that the difficulty of the universal axis is the sag under the weight of the, like when we use the one inch axes, we thought that would work, but they ended up sagging by the, all the weight of those axes. And as we said before, because of the auto bed leveling, we can probably correct that. We can probably get away with it. But if we did something like this, one, you're like, they're cheap because it costs you five bucks for a, a bottle of bearings like this um, and you can scale this up so think about this with large bearings half inch an inch what is the limit the limit is well the ball bearings are tens of thousands of psi of steel <coughs> the plastic for abs you're close to 10,000 psi well that's some serious force that this could hold um, and those balls are kind of recirculating. So basically think about, okay, you've got that weight spread over, over all those balls. If you want this to be more and more heavy duty, I mean, enlarge this, make it larger so that each ball bearing receives a smaller fraction of the entire force. 
Um, but this is a very powerful concept. The, the way you print this for production engineering, we know that prints have a little bit, you know, your, your 0.4 millimeter strands, or possibly better if you use a smaller nozzle. But the way you would have to print this, definitely the lengthwise, so the lines are running along. So pretty much the lengthwise where the balls are going, you're going with the actual strands of the print. So there's a little bit of detail on production engineering of how you print this thing. But other than that, we have, uh, that gets you to about the, the accuracy of what we have in the current system, which is amazing to, to get very precise 3D printers. Better, like better quality than, than even ours. Uh, yeah. if, uh, if you don't need to deal with heavy loads, or, and if it's okay to have a little bit of friction, it is also possible to 3D print this. Like the same as with plastic linear bearings that we've we've been using. Like my 3D printer at home, actually, I I printed the uh, I printed the X carriage for it. Yeah, and it works pretty well. Yeah, and there's a there's a cool. So if you talk about bear, bearings for, that are 3D printed, did you see that star shaped one? I, the flexible one. I'm Let's pull this up because uh, this is important. Like, how do you actually make a nice linear bearing out of plastic? That the flexible ones, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Let's pull that up because I want to show you that. Um, so there'll be 3D printed linear bearing, I would say. No, that uh, 3D printed I got so many 3D printed things here. <coughs> We can find it. I had a hard time actually finding it on the internet. Um, Three printed linear bearing. No, that's not the one. Oh, I'll show you another one on the wiki that's related to shafts a little bit. Uh, 3D printed springs. It turns out that you can actually print in midair too. So, uh, go to 3D printed springs, hit that. Whoa. You go up. Oh. Wow. Now, what's the relevance of that? <laughs> you can do that. Oh, how do they so, yeah, the going slow enough slow. and controlling it huh. and having a lot of blower fan. So we have a blower fan on the 3D printer. So yeah. 3D printed wow. springs on the wiki. Uh, why is it relevant to the universal axis? In the application of the CNC circuit mill, we had the Z axis on the carriage with a spindle, which weighs about a kilogram. So what, what happens is when you turn the power off, it just drops. Well, if you have a bit on that, that's just gonna smash into the table. So what we did is we put springs on the upper side of the universal axis so that it would bottom up around the, the, the rods. We put springs around the rods so that you wouldn't drop all the way. It will keep it suspended. Springs are good. I wanted to show the 3D printed linear bearing since we're talking about bearings and shafts. You can do 3D printed if belts. Just, Go ahead. If you just Google uh, 3D, listen, 3D printed linear bearing, this is kind of what you're talking about, right, Marshall? No, no. That's not the one Not that about. one. There's a better one. Never mind. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 3D printed. Um, essentially, I can't find it. It's somewhere I did put on the wiki somewhere. But it's a thing that. So think about it as. When you have a bearing, like you don't want to print just like a just a tube with a hole, right? You can want to have a little bit of give there. So what you can do is do like a one layer, or like a shape that's you know you, you got your linear bearing like the ones we're using. 
but it's shaped like that, so it's going in and out. So it's got less surface area. Uh, that's one part, but it's also flexible. You can actually like squeeze that, and the way it turns up, it kind of twists as it goes up, so it makes sure it contacts the shaft everywhere. And it, so it's flexible, and it fits very nicely onto the shaft without being like tight or like open space. Really nice design, but you can download that too. It's it's on Thingiverse somewhere. I just can't uh, show that to the people. But no, I'm not talking that's, about. That's not it. Okay. It's not I'm it. It's, it's um, 3D printed uh, star. Oh, I think it's on Thingiverse. 3D Thingiverse.com. Um, linear bearing so it's kind of like star shaped and no no not not that either <laughs> it's a lot of it's like things, so cool apparently yeah that are star shaped <laughs> it's the essential difference of that is like well what you're showing has like an outer shell uh like a thicker shell on the outside this thing is like one line kind of without an outer shell. Um, um, blah, blah. I'll, I'll send, I'll, uh, when we post edit this, like later on, I'll try to add that shape, because it's really, really nice, really nice design. But basically the concept being that you have access to any kind of complex geometry. And you can also draw that in FreeCAD rather easily. In FreeCAD you, you can draw this as kind of a, you can reverse engineer it. Um, you can draw that star kind of shape and you can extrude that while rotating it so you can actually reverse engineer it because actually what, uh, I did notice that it's not an open source design actually it, mm. it's a non-commercial license on that bearing so we have to redo it ourselves to be uh, able to build those um, no. Anyway, okay, so that kind of wraps it up. So basically, okay, you got heavy duty metal for shafts, and then you can get into access of 3D printing. So just to develop, like, like that linear bearing that was shown there, developing practical kits for that to sell, I mean, that is billions of dollars of value. I mean, bearings are a core of civilization. So I think I'll wrap up there and maybe take any questions. Any questions on shafts and bearings and any questions from the remote audience? Question. Uh, you said that uh, uh, that's, what did you say PLA or Plastic Union names? Uh, yeah, ABS. Has, uh, five, oh, just plastic generally. So ABS uh, has uh, five to ten thousand uh, psi of uh, strength. Is yeah. That, is that true? Uh, when it's is it the same? Is that just for uh, so press. Really solid injection molded? Okay. Solid. Okay, so when with 3D printing, you tend to have some uh, some air in there, don't you? Or is, or is you can select to have zero to 100 percent air. Okay. So you can completely set that's called a fill in the fill percentage. Mm. So usually, typically, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that usually it's if it's zero zero percent in film means totally air, and 100 percent in film means totally plastic. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you have that variability. You just set the control settings when you you load a file into Cura, which is the software we use. You set the percentage of infill in there, and that's uh, you can select that. And the PSI measurement is pounds per square inch, so it's area independent, mm -hmm. right? So you know what the strength of the material is on a unit area basis, which means that in, in an inch by an inch, you have you can apply 5,000 pounds and that's where it will fail. And so you can do the same thing you do a quarter inch by a quarter inch, you just factor it down, okay. right? Or factor it up and so you can come up with the compressive strength of the material, or the, the compressive force that you can apply to a material through the compressive strength. So like if you have, let's say you have 5,000 pounds per square inch and you have a five inch area, you can apply 25,000 pounds, 2,500 pounds, 2,500 pounds to that area because you're going to say you can take 5,000 pounds per square inch. Mm -hmm. Is that right? 
Twenty five thousand dollars, right? Yeah. The first time. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, let's see any questions in the audience. Okay. If not, then yeah, we can go back down to the workshop. So let us start on the controller. So uh, what I proposed was that we get a little break of pace, get into the controller. Once it once again here, please let's do that all together as a team. And we way we guarantee that it's done rapidly and effectively. Yeah. So we're gonna have somebody standing up and saying, Okay, now put this piece. Yeah. Here. So what we'll do is simply uh, I'll I'll do one and or maybe for whoever and I'll sh I'll demonstrate on one and as I'm demonstrating you guys are all doing it at the same time. We we found that worked quite well in the previous builds and we were able to knock it out pretty quickly. And, and it should be pretty quick. So now there's going to be some soldering steps done like we'll start with mounting all the components. We do have the plug that we're making so it means cutting the the stock material for the blades, 1 inch pieces and then soldering the wires to them. So there's a little bit of soldering for people who want to learn soldering. Uh, or we can just, if we're running out of time, which, I mean, we are running into the constraint as we talked about the open source chain gang working tonight to make sure we're finished because tomorrow we want to have all the printers ready uh, so that we're designing and starting to prototype like right there. That's so kind of, kind of pace yourself for today. Uh, personally, I'm ready to do what it takes to finish because we really want to have those printers that we're producing parts for the next phase. So when we do this today, like, okay, maybe just let's just give the soldering to someone who just can just knock it out because we, can, uh, we can't make it into a full lesson for everybody, you know. Um, but you can uh, at other times or in after hours or whatever, but I would really suggest we try to get this thing knocked out. All right. Well, thank you very much, and we'll we'll come back at two p.m. So let's um, William let's get everybody set up. Um,